Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, we join each other across the world, different devices and different times, yet we continue to be drawn by the same truth. No matter who we are, no matter where we are on life's journey, we are welcome here. Let us begin our time together and stand for the responsive call to worship. Christ is risen, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Christ is risen indeed. Please join us in singing hymn number 248. You may be seated. Friends, let us together seek God's transformation and forgiveness, knowing that even as we confess our shortcomings, we confess our belief in a forgiving God, which is particularly good news when there's an enormous typo. And yes, it is the same one from last week. So will you pray the prayer of confession with me, and we'll just skip the second, Lord, in your mercy, forgive us. Let's pray together. God of grace, you call us to generosity. You are generous towards us, yet we often hold back. You give us the gift of time to serve, learn, grow, and share, yet we often spend our time serving self. You have given us talents and abilities, yet at times we hide our gifts. Lord, in your mercy, forgive us. Remind us that you are a God of abundance and not of scarcity. Open our eyes to the possibility of full life when we give graciously and dream boldly. Amen. Friends, the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. As a forgiven and reconciled people, let us give thanks and share a sign of Christ's peace with those around us. The peace of Christ be with you.
Grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus Christ, and welcome to worship at Ewing Covenant Presbyterian Church. So glad to welcome you all this morning, any visitors especially. We're so glad that you're here, and we would love to get to know you. A couple of announcements. First, this morning, we began the diaper challenge, which means we're collecting packages of diapers of all sizes, as well as baby wipes, as a donation to Homefront. We'll be collecting these items through May 5th, and you may either bring them to worship or drop them in the Scout Hut. Now, I'm very excited to announce that the one and only Rosa Ross, who's in extreme demand, is actually here this morning to lead adult education. She'll be sharing experiences from her work as a chaplain, both at TCNJ as well as Princeton University. She'll also talk about the ways that Ewing Covenant can support and be part of UKirk the campus ministry at TCNJ. Everyone is invited to join us for this after coffee hour. Now raise your hand if you'll indulge me. If you are dying to know, what is the connection between some ugly shoes and Judas? Okay, just like four of us, but surely you're wondering now about this morning's sermon title, Judas and something with Crocs. Pink Crocs. Pink Crocs. Well, I have been wondering about this all weekend, so I'm so excited that Emily Knoth returns as our guest preacher. So will you please join me as we welcome her this morning. Now, some of you may have gotten a suspicious email from Carol Dakin this weekend wanting me to purchase things on Amazon. Did anyone else get that email? So Carol wants to be sure that everyone knows that that's not her. She's not asking you to buy gift cards. Delete it, don't respond. And actually, this is a good reminder about all of these phishing emails. Some of you have gotten emails from me that aren't me. Now we've gotten emails from Carol. So we should all be careful if anyone's asking you to make a purchase or buy gift cards. Do you want to add anything to that, Carol? You see my name, just delete it. Yep. All right. And now I invite you to join me in the sung prayer for illumination. Our first lesson today is from Psalm 133. How very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head running down upon the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down over the collar of his robes like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord ordained his blessing, life forevermore, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, good morning. Before I start our second reading, I want to apologize for my voice. I feel fine, but I had a cold a few days ago, and it took my voice. It just took it and ran with it. 
So I'm hoping to have it back soon. But I apologize for my voice. Our second reading comes from the book of John, chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. Hear the word of the Lord. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, Leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. The word of the Lord. Let's pray. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing to you. Amen. Amen. So in this lectionary season, I'm actually taking us backwards. We had the resurrection. We're hitting rewind. We're going back to a few days before the death of Jesus. We're also going back to Crocs. Does anyone own Crocs? Jane, I knew Jane. You and I knew that, Jane. I had a feeling you and I would. Who else? Oh, oh, that side of the room. Okay, okay. One of my most prized possession is my pair of Crocs. I know you're thinking I'm being a little dramatic, but I am convinced my Crocs are one of God's greatest gifts. They're not only stylish with their metallic pink color and cool slip-on strap, they're comfortable, they're breathable, they're very practical, right, Jane? I think they're practical, and they're a great conversation starter. A lot of people might tell you that Birkenstocks or Chacos are what the cool church kids wear, but I promise you, it's Crocs. Now, if you're wondering why I'm talking about Crocs, which is a valid thing to be wondering, it's because I've been thinking a lot about what kind of shoes Jesus would have been wearing before Mary anointed his feet. I'm going to take an educated guess and say it was probably not Crocs. And although that is a tad bit disappointing for me because I do love the idea of Jesus rocking some Crocs, it doesn't make Mary's act of anointing any less cool or any less weird or extravagant, or dramatic, or powerful. Because this passage is incredibly powerful. And I want to talk about power for a quick moment here, specifically Mary's power as the anointer of Christ. There are two main ways scholars interpret Mary's anointing of Jesus. The first is as an anointing for burial. Mary's actions can be seen as an anointing of Jesus' body for burial, and thus she performed a prophetic action in every sense of the word, because Jesus would be killed only days later. The second is an anointing for kingship. Susan E. Hyland, a professor of New Testament at Candler, says this, For kings and priests, anointing meant consecration for a specific purpose. Because of this literary context, Mary's actions anticipate and enact the notion that Jesus is king. So Mary's actions can also be seen as an anointing of Jesus as king, again making her actions prophetic in every sense of the word. Mary sees Jesus. She knows he is king. And she knows what is about to happen to him. Even though everyone else around her seems to miss it. So this act, this prophetic act, though powerful, is first and foremost an extravagant act of love. So extravagant that pushes our friend Judas into a level of discomfort and even anger that prods him to dismiss Mary. 
And our author of the book of John obviously has no issues making Judas out to be the bad guy here. And who's to blame him, right? It's easy to hate Judas. He's bullying Mary. He might be a thief. He's overall just kind of grumpy. But I have a confession to make. I have totally been the Judas in this story before. I have my own story that mimics that of Judas's, as I'm sure many of you might as well, but mine goes back to the Crocs. So when I was in college, I managed a nonprofit called Westside Free Store Ministries. The Westside Free Store gave out free clothes and small household items to anyone who needed them. And there were three employees at the free store, the executive director, Deborah, the manager, me, and the doorman, Kelly. Kelly lived right next door to the free store with his best friend, an older woman named Anne. Anne was disabled and wasn't able to leave her home, so Kelly was her, man, her main caretaker. Kelly volunteered at his church every day, took care of Anne all evening, and worked at the free store for about five hours every Saturday morning. Because of him only working about five hours a week, he was often in need of basic supplies for his home, food for himself and Anne, and supplies for his dog, lovingly named Pinky. Over time, Kelly and I became great friends, and I would often grab him food or household items or books that he wanted when I could. One day, as Kelly and I were leaving the free store together, I asked if he needed me to buy anything for him. And he said, no. Toilet paper, laundry detergent? I prodded. Oh, he said, laundry detergent would be great. I really need laundry detergent. I haven't been able to buy any. So I let him know I would grab some for him. We hugged goodbye, and he walked towards his house. I pulled out my phone to add detergent to my grocery list, and suddenly I look up, and I see Kelly. And he's running back towards me, arms flailing, looking like a kid who forgot his lunchbox at school. Hey, he screamed, I forgot to ask. At this point, he stops, he catches his breath, and then he says, do you know those slip-on shoes? The one with the holes in them? You just slip them on and then right off again? No straps or anything, you've got a pair, I've seen you wear them. Crocs, I asked. Yeah, he said. Where can I buy a pair? Where do I get those? Now, this is where my Judas moment really starts shining. I'll be honest, I got annoyed. I was buying this man his laundry detergent for the month, and he's out shoe shopping? You're kidding, right? So I say, Kelly, why do you need Crocs? He slapped me on the shoulder and he laughed so hard, you would have thought I was Tina Fey. I don't need Crocs, he says. Anne's feet are swelling up really bad from her new medicine. You know she loves when I take her out in the wheelchair for a walk around the neighborhood, but she can't get her shoes on anymore, so I'm saving up. I'm getting her some Crocs. I was Judas. I was 19. I'm young now but 19's even younger, so I'll use it as an excuse. I was 19, I was frustrated, I was tired, and so I looked Kelly in the eyes and I said, Kelly, don't you think you should use that money on food? Or laundry detergent? He smiled at me and he knew something I very obviously didn't yet know, and that would take me years to figure out. He said, that's okay, Emily. Last weekend, we were in the hospital after Anne had a bad breathing episode, and it sounds like she doesn't have a lot of time left, so I'm going to get her the Crocs. I don't need detergent this month. Don't worry about it. When reflecting on our passage today, the professor of New Testament at Luther Seminary, Matt Skinner, says this. We can understand the economic and charitable logic beneath Judas's criticism but we should also recognize it resembles rigorous, unyielding piety that cannot stomach a wild love like Mary's. Acts of true grace and love regularly get slandered 
as deviance. We should recognize that it resembles rigorous, unyielding piety that cannot stomach a wild love like Mary's. Acts of true grace and love regularly get slandered as deviants. Friends, it is so easy to be Judas. At least I think so. And here's why. Judas is showcasing a problem as old as dirt. His religion is getting in the way of his God. Does that mean his religion is wrong? No, absolutely not. It's obvious to the reader giving money to the poor is in no way wrong. It's a fantastic rule of thumb, and 90% of the time, it makes perfect sense to live by that rule. But that doesn't mean it can't get in the way. I wonder, have you ever had someone's ridiculous, wild, passionate act of love get in the way? Did it confuse you? annoy you, make you think they had their priorities all out of whack, or maybe it ruined your plans for the day, or the week, or the year, maybe it shook up your schedule, turned your life upside down. What was your response to the act of wild and passionate love? Were you like Judas, like me? Did you hold onto your religion, your logic, and your rules? Did you hold on with this white knuckled grip so tight you couldn't even appreciate the act of love for what it was? I know I was. In my story of my friend Kelly, if I was Judas, Kelly was Mary. Kelly got it. He knew. He knew the rules say he should take care of himself first, do the right thing, buy the food, the detergent, be logical. But Kelly knew that God was calling to him to create this extravagant act of love for someone who wouldn't be here much longer. Kelly knew God was not in the laundry detergent. God was in the crocs. <laughs> God was in this ridiculously selfless act of extravagance, using three weeks of paychecks for a pair of shoes for a woman on her deathbed. That same act of love, where Mary used one pound of pure nard to anoint the feet of Jesus, who soon, too, would be on the cross. Friends, Christ reminds us that if we hold our religion with a white knuckled grip, then we will never be able to stomach a true, passionate act of love. We must hold our religion softly enough to give room for these acts of love. Because in them is where Christ is. And in this season of Easter tide, we must reflect and ask ourselves what is the life of Jesus if not an act of wild? extravagant and ridiculous love. Amen. Friends, at this time, I believe we are joining in hymn number 510. We gather here in Jesus' name.
You may be seated. The psalmist proclaims that the earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. The blessings of life and breath, friendship and financial resources are gifts from God. In that spirit, we thank you for your own gifts of generosity, which support the ministries of Ewing Covenant Presbyterian Church. Christian and myself, we didn't uh, sing. Hopefully, uh, we could uh, remember uh, how to sing. <laughs> and uh, this morning, we would like to uh, sing a song uh, to praise the Lord. Uh, and uh, the name of the song is... Um, we know that uh, it's going on a lot of things in, in the world, in Israel, in, uh, in um, uh, um, this uh, country, uh, what's the Ukraine. Ukraine, yeah, I was, I was thinking about Ukraine, I apologize. Ukraine and uh, so many places, and uh, uh, it's very sad what is going on, so we like to sing a song that says that uh, it's about brighter days that we are um, um, we will have in this planet Earth. Not today, probably pretty soon, uh, with the favor of God. Okay. Okay. I apologize for this uh, situation that uh, our technician uh, just put the uh, uh, sound system for this. Uh, There's gonna be some brighter days. I swear the love will find you in your pain. I feel it in me like the beating of life in my vein. I know there's gonna be some brighter days. I know there's gonna be some brighter days. Oh, if your screams don't make a sound Oh, if your walls are crashing down Oh, if your heart just cries too loud all the time All the time Oh, I know there's gonna be some brighter days I swear the love will find you in your pain. I feel it in me like the beating of lives in my veins. I know there's gonna be some brighter days. I know there's gonna be some brighter days. Oh, oh. I swear the love will find you in your pain. I feel it in me like the beating of lies in my veins. Whoa, I know there's gonna be some brighter days. I swear the love will find you in your pain. I feel it in me like the beating of lives in my veins. 
I know there's gonna be some brighter days. I know there's gonna be some brighter days. I know there's gonna be some brighter days. Thank you. As we dedicate our gifts of time and treasure, will you pray with me the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. Friends, we are all invited to gather around this table. Regardless of how deserving we think that we are, regardless of how broken we may feel, regardless of how put together our lives may look to everyone else, this is God's table. And we are, each one of us, invited just as we are. All that we need is here. And in that spirit, if you prefer to take communion in your pew using the pre-filled sets, would you please raise your hand so that a deacon may serve them to you? And for those who wish, you may come forward to receive the elements. We'll start on this side, take the bread first, dip it into the wine, and then exit off this way so there's not any congestion. And if you want to receive the elements via intinction at your seat, you can just wave at me after everyone up here is done. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Let us pray. We offer you praise, dear God, and hearts lifted high. For in the communion of your love, Christ comes close to us, and we come close to Christ. And so with prayerful spirits, we give thanks for this abundance. We give thanks for the food that is before us, produced from the earth. The scriptures tell us that in the beginning, God created people in her likeness. And these creatures, these people, became many, people of many genders, races, bodies, and abilities. God created us for each other, to accompany each other, love each other, serve each other, and live together in peace. God created the world and all that is in it without borders or walls or colonies and said that it was good. We give thanks for the goodness of creation and with our ancestors of every time and place, we join in the song of your unending greatness. We give thanks, too, for Jesus, our sibling, born of Mary in a stable in Palestine, 
a vulnerable baby who would confront the powers and the principalities of his time and of ours, and who welcomed as friends the people whom society said were not good enough. He walked with them and ate with them, and through shared meals he continues to teach us of abundance. And then Jesus, for love and for liberation of his people, risked his life and was executed by the empire. Yet even death could not put an end to the love that he embodies. Out of death, he arose to new life to live again among his people. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We ask of the Spirit that Jesus be present here as we share this bread and this cup through these ordinary things that sustain us, our bodies. May we be nourished and transformed so that we remember that we belong to each other and to God. Through this remembering, may we also proclaim that there is enough for everyone. Through this remembering, we must remember that we are stronger together that we are called to live together with justice, to support one another, to lovingly challenge one another, and to honor the spark of divine in one another. Amen. On the night that he was arrested by the authorities, Jesus had gathered in an upper room to celebrate the story of Passover with his closest friends. He took the bread, gave thanks and blessed it, broke it, and said, take, eat. This is my body broken for you, and whenever you eat of it, remember me. In the same way, following supper, he took the cup and said, this is a new covenant poured out for you sealed in my blood. Whenever you drink of this cup, remember me. So now, following Jesus' example, we take these ordinary things and remember the bodies that continue to be broken by the powers and principalities of our time. We also remember the new relationship with which God continually calls us a relationship where peace comes through justice. Thank you. 
Will you please join me in prayer? O oh God, our mystery, you bring us to life, call us to freedom, and move between us with love. Now that we have been fed at your table, may we go into this wondrous and difficult world to build each other up, to confront powers and principalities, to live and love boldly into the promise that there is enough, enough food, enough justice, enough love, enough peace, enough dignity for everyone. Amen. Will you please stand and join me in singing hymn number 157. different heights. Friends, as you leave this place, may you remember that the very same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, that allowed Jesus to continue living a life of extravagant love, is within you and will go wherever you may go. Amen. Amen.
Okay, we're going to have some excitement now, like we didn't have enough earlier, right? <laughs> it's my mother's 92nd birthday. We have a cake, so you're all invited afterwards.